On December 11, 1941, Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Until that time, the United States had maintained neutrality, although it had, since March of that same year, supplied the Allies with war materials through the Lend-Lease Act. During the war, over 16 million Americans served in the United States military. The European theater was a horrific fight. Many American soldiers paid the ultimate sacrifice to ensure our country's freedom. Following the defeat of the German army in the Ardennes, the Allies pushed back toward the Rhine and the heart of Germany. With the capture of the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen, the Allies crossed the Rhine in March 1945. The Germans surrendered Berlin to the Soviets on May 2, 1945. After the war, American soldiers returned home to start a new life. Here are some stories from local veterans who served our great country in Europe during and after World War II. We were shipped over in September and became part of General Patton's Third Army. We went into the Third Army at Nancy, it was where we first saw combat. That's southeast of Paris. And fought through, I was in the artillery. I didn't want the infantry. When I enlisted, I could pick out what I wanted. And I wanted to be an ammunition truck driver because there was a little thrill involved there. Because all it takes is, uh, uh, round into the load and you make a big hole in the road. So that was my duty, was to keep the 105 howitzers supplied with ammunition. There were 12 guns in our battalion. Three batteries, three firing batteries, four guns each. And when we got to Metz, we thought we were going to spend the winter there because the information was that it was going to be a severe winter and the Germans wouldn't do anything. We got there on the uh, 14th of December into Metz, and on the 16th, the Germans broke through on the uh, so-called bulge, Ardennes uh, uh, event, and General Patton wanted, ordered us to go north, to just keep going north till you run into Germans. We had no idea where we were going, so the way they moved the division was straight, uh, his idea. They leapfrogged the infantry, pick them up in the truck, run them up away, dump them out, go back and get the others and leapfrog them. And of course, in the artillery, we were hauling our guns and I had a full load of ammo. So when we got into uh, Luxembourg first, the border of Luxembourg is where we met the Germans. And then it was just misery until January the 20th, 25th when we left because the temperature dropped so low. We were in snow. One night it dropped to 19 below zero and we had kids freeze to death in their foxholes. Uh, there was one incident I wanted to tell you about in France before we got to Metz. It was the night we got captured. We hadn't had a warm meal for some time. Bob and I were sitting in our ammo truck. It was about 10 o'clock at night when Lieutenant Allen, the ammunition officer, came by with his weapons carrier. Said, I want, he said, I want you guys to hop in the back. I want to take you back to the battery for a hot meal. So he went around and picked up all six of us, two to the truck, and the three batteries. And on the way, we were riding along with the back flap down. And all of a sudden, the truck stopped. And the driver, Lieutenant Allen's driver, spoke fluent German. We could hear him speaking to some Germans in German answering. And Lieutenant Allen lifted the flap and said, boys, we've just been captured. Now, I don't want anyone 
I don't want anyone being hurt. Be very careful. When you get out, hold your weapons with a gu the barrel up, eject your clip and, and the cartridge in the chamber, and lay your guns down, put your hands up. Don't try anything funny. So when I threw that flap up and looked out and saw those Germans, it was you know, about 10, 10.30 by this time, and it was raining as usual in France. But I could make out these ugly German helmets, and there they were, seven of them with their guns pointing at us. So we all followed uh, the, the order, except for Covell, who pulled the trigger and fired around off and almost got us all shot. The Germans, when they had us disarmed, turned their guns around and handed them to us, held them out to us, took their steel helmets off and threw them in the ditch, and one of them said, Comrade, haven't seen cigarette? And we were buddies right then. I, had, I gave uh, out cigarettes, I gave out what little candy I had in my pocket, and uh, the, we, we were marching them along the road, followed by the weapons carrier, and Lieutenant Allen said, hell, they're not gonna run away, so one of, one of the fellows could go with them to the PW compound, which was just quite half a mile up the road. We all got back in the back of the weapons carrier, and we hadn't gone very far when uh, the driver ran smack into the back of a, to a six by, loaded with German landmines, and we got all tumbled up, and I, I was bleeding pretty severely from a cut on my chin, and Bob, my partner, was cut from the gun sight, my gun sight. So we were offered the Purple Heart, and both Bob and I turned it down because I wouldn't want to go through life saying I got a Purple Heart for a fender bender. The Germans were coming through, infiltrating, dressed in American uniforms, and driving American equipment. So one night in particular, I was back at the battery and the, I was told I had guard duty from midnight to four in the morning and to take Porky with me. Porky was very unreliable. I asked for the password and the first sergeant said, heck, I don't know what it is. He said, think of something. That's a, not a very smart thing to do. So Porky and I were out on this very frozen dirt road. The, the fellows were in the barn and the officers were in the, bar, uh, the farmhouse. And that was all that was there. And we heard a jeep coming from the east where the Germans were. Porky immediately said, I'll cover you from the barn. Well, when he got to the barn, he couldn't even see me. Well, he was frightened. He just ran off. When the jeep stopped and I leaned down to look under the, the uh, top, I could see that the passenger was wearing an American uniform, officer's uniform, because he had bars on his shoulder, they were gleaming. And I knew right away he had to be a German, because American officers don't wear bars in combat. There was a man, in, there was somebody in the back seat who had a blanket pulled up to his chin and I knew he had a gun on me, I could feel it. And the driver wouldn't even look at me, just stared straight ahead. I said, well, he doesn't speak English. The passenger spoke excellent English. I asked him for the password. He said, hell, I don't know, do you? And I, I didn't know it either. <laughs> so I asked him uh, uh, who won the World Series in 1940. And he said, I don't follow baseball. How would I know that? So I asked him where he was from. He said, Oakland, California. I said, well, my God, I'm from Berkeley. Right away, I thought of a question. Where's the best place to get a hot dog in Oakland? He said, cross from the roller rink on Telegraph Avenue. Caspers, and across from the Uni High, or Oakland High, Oakland Tech rather, on Broadway, down at, by Lake Meridot on East 14th. Well, I knew all those locations. I said, oh, hell, you're an American, but I knew he wasn't. He said, what'd you think I was, a kraut? So I said, okay, you gotta go. If I'd have tried to stop him, I'd have been a dead man. That guy in the back seat would have nailed me and off they would have gone. And Basically what they did was change roadsides around. Maybe blow up a little bridge here and there, but that was about the most problem they cost us. So I was glad to get rid of them. Well, when the, uh, the bulge ended in January, about mid-January, 24th or 25th, we crossed the Rhine, started chasing the Germans, and it was just go every day because they were just falling back. And they were surrendering by battalions. 
companies, individuals. And you just tell them, keep walking. We didn't have any way to handle them. You know? And we went up into Austria and uh, from Austria to uh, Czechoslovakia. And on May the 9th, the war ended. And uh, we met the, the Soviet Army uh, on the, in Czechoslovakia. We returned to Upper Austria, where we were supposed to prepare to go to the Pacific. And President Truman dropped the bombs. That ended the war. And I've always said, thank you, Harry. zigzagging around, uh, evading the submarines. And one of our troop ships got sunk a mile ahead of us, and we never stopped to pick them up. That was the rule. The, the convoy had to go, you had to go. I mean, uh, two, two sailors on our ship fell overboard and never picked them up. Just kept on going. I thought it was kind of cruel, but uh, that's the way that, that's the way it goes. But anyway, well, I landed in La Havre, France, and from there on we took a troop train. I got to Repo Depot and he said, Well, I'm sorry. He said there's not enough casualties in the Anna Tank where you took your training in. We're gonna have to stick you in the machine gunners. But he said, Don't worry, he said the average life up there is a minute and a half. And that scared the living heck right out of me. <laughs> so I got to my, my uh, company H, 35th Infantry, in Reims, France, uh, right around Christmas time. We had a Christmas dinner. And right after the Christmas dinner, Patton gave the orders, General Patton gave the orders, come on, get going, we gotta go to Bastogne. Where the hell is Bastogne? I don't know, but we found out. We got to Bastogne and dropped me off, me and another fella in a foxhole. This is right out of Bastogne. And uh, we got in the foxhole and this fella started crying. And uh, he was 29 years old, he had two kids. And I said, what's wrong? He said, well, he said, I'm, my feet are freezing and, and he said, I'm missing my home. And I said, mine are freezing too. I said, uh, what should we do? He said, I said, well, you take off your shoes and I'll take off my shoes. I rub our feet all night long, keep in circulation. So there was a lot of frozen feet up there. And uh, I froze my feet that my, the bottom of my feet were white for 30 years. But anyway, in Bastogne, uh, we uh, set up our guns and so forth. And it was snowing, it was about two foot of snow and uh, about 20 below zero. It was one of the coldest uh, weathers that they had there. The medics up there in Bastogne couldn't get to all of the fellows that got killed because uh, there was under fire and there's too many got killed. There's so many got killed there in Bastogne. I think the estimate was 100,000 Germans and 80,000 Americans got killed in that one battle within a month. The, the, the medics couldn't get to all the, all the fellas and, uh, because the Germans would fire at the medics. And the medics uh, had the white or uh, red cross and a white background on their helmets. No guns whatsoever. We stayed there for about two or three days, and then we moved up to a ditch along the road with, with my gun, with our gun, and a rifleman right alongside of us. And we was to, to guard that road. Well, on a machine gun, you're on the guard two hours and off four. It only takes one man on a machine gun. And uh, so when I was on, on a machine gun, the rifleman, we heard some noise, and the rifleman said to me, he says, hey, machine gunner, he said, don't open up fire until I do. I said, okay, I'll hold fire. And all at once we heard some noises, and here come five bareback horses down the road, 
to draw our fire. So it was my turn to go off. I went back to a shed about 500 feet, 500 yards back, and uh, where we slept for a couple hours, and all at once, all hell broke loose. There's bullets to start going through. This was in a shed, 500 yards. The bullets start going through, and sergeant says, go on and retrieve the gun. Help the fellow, you know, it takes two, two fellows to carry the gun. He said, go up there and help him. So I ran up there, and the, the riflemen were coming back. He said, what the heck are you coming up here for? He said, the, the Germans are coming. We're, we're, we're in retreat. And the bullets were flying around. I finally got up to the gun. And when I was pulled a belt out of the gun, I saw three or four Germans take an aim. I stuck that belt back in, and we mowed them down. And we ran back with the, with the, uh, with the uh, gun. He had the tripod, and I had the gun zigzagging. Otherwise, we would have got to killed for sure. After our, the, the war was over in Germany, but uh, it ended in, in, you know, in, in August, I believe it was. And uh, that's the only thing that saved our lives, really, was Truman dropping that atomic bomb. The division went overseas October 6th from New York, arriving in Marseille, France on October 20th, uh, 1944. Um, we finally got online November 1st, replacing the 45th, 45th Infantry Division. All right, I was an infantry scout and the division in my regiment was outside of a place called Fortress Du Beach in Alsace-Lorraine. It was a city that hadn't been taken. It was a fortified city, had not been taken in 200 years, and the division finally took it. However, on the 2nd of January, 1945, I and another fellow were sent out as perimeter guards on a uh, 30 caliber machine gun. And um, we couldn't see down the, the hill to the road, but um, we kept firing at people we thought we saw. When they, they finally knocked us out with concussion grenades, they being the Germans, and we were um, taken down to the bottom of the hill and uh, frisked and then sent into the fortress. Um, one of the interesting things was I had in my field jack pocket uh, a German rifle cleaning kit. And the idea was that if they found that on you, they'd have figured you had killed a German and they would do something horrible to you. So anyway, the, uh, the person that, took, that frisked me took the um, uh, cleaning kit out of my jacket, field jacket pocket looked at it and looked at me and said, Deutsch, I didn't answer. He then tried to give it to a private on the side of the road and he's, the private said, nine, nine, which meaning no, no. And then he just threw it in the ditch, which I breathed a big sigh of relief. Um, as I said, we were taken into the prison. And then over the next few days, we were interrogated. But unfortunately, the Germans, for their part, could not speak English that well, so they learned nothing from us. Uh, they then marched us to a few villages, put us on 40 and 8 cars, which were meant for 40 men or 8 horses, and there were 65 men in the car, uh, and transported us to a place called Ludwigsburg in southern Germany, where we were incarcerated. Um, I was I felt that I, uh, my life was saved by a Nisi soldier who was a medic with that 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And uh, he examined me because he was, the Germans were having him examine all the troops to see if they were able to walk from Ludwigsburg to Munich, which was quite a distance. Um, he told me I'd had to stay right there because I had pleurisy. 
but the Germans took it to be TB and they kept me in a room with eight Frenchmen and one Pole for the remainder of the war and um, thinking I had TB and their treatment was open the windows wide. Of course, there was snow on the ground. Uh, it was the dead of winter and uh, did a, a lot of other things that I found out later were things that were done in U.S. medicine years and years before. Uh, um, we were finally liberated by the first French army and then I was transported to a hospital in Paris and then flown home to Letterman Hospital in San Francisco. We were awakened early in the morning with the roar of thousands of aircraft painted with white stripes, the invasion stripes, uh, to prevent the catastrophe that occurred at Sicily when naval gunners shot down our carriers with paratroopers. And we knew that we were set to go into the invasion and we had to waterproof all of our weapons and trucks and so forth. Um, the invasion actually began on June 6th with the uh, airborne operation and then the troops landing. We were moved down into the Southampton residential areas and then eventually several days after that boarded a landing craft tank, LCTs, for transport over to France. Um, well, I can tell you going in we, uh, we could see the bursts on the beach. We were firing, we were under the fire of the USS Texas 16-inch guns going overhead. We hit Omaha Beach and proceeded up the, uh, we dropped our ramp and uh, went into four feet of water. The Jeep went completely under, but we were all waterproof. And then the beach was littered with the wounded, which would go back to England on our LCT. We proceeded up the uh, exit off the beach and went into firing position, firing on St. Lo, which was a key city uh, there. Um, after that, we got into the hedgerow fighting, which is terrible. The intelligence people had been informed that hedgerows were in France, but they discounted it because the hedgerows in, in England were just a few feet high. We got in there and found 12 foot high, 8 to 12 foot high uh, hedgerows which had stymied the Romans when they came through there. Each one was well defended, the Germans and our guys had trouble getting through. And finally, they developed a tank uh, like a bulldozer that could take down some of those. Um, we drove the Germans out of there and then went into a stalemate of the type until July 25th when again thousands of bombers uh, caused a big breakout and that's when Patton's army uh, came ashore and went uh, operational August 1st. That's when we broke out of Normandy and uh, zipped around in our own Blitzkrieg and headed towards Paris. We're north of France run out of gas which had been transferred over to Patton for a quick strike into Germany. Uh, eventually, we uh, passed on the north side of France, Patton was on the south side, and entered Belgium on 3rd September, and uh, then proceeded, we were chasing the Bosch, the Germans, and uh, went on to Maastricht Holland, and then we got up to the border of Germany at Herlin, Holland, and began firing into the 800-year-old beautiful city of Aachen, which was Charlemagne's throne and birthplace, and destroyed that with a tremendous fighter. It had no military value. It was a psychological victory for us because Hitler had said we would never uh, take a town in Germany. So after that, uh, we proceeded from there to the Hurtgen Force, which was again not another military objective, but the higher ups felt that it should be taken, and it was a very bloody, terrible battle, a meat grinder. And from then, that's when the Battle of the Bulge occurred. 
a good quarter of a million men, thousands of tanks, um, and proceeded to, with an assault against some weak divisions that were in there being refitted and because they had been hurt in the Hurtgen Forest and poured into and made a bulge in the lines, which is where the name come from, came, comes from, uh, from the Ardennes Forest, which is the Ardennes Offensive, actually the real name, and caused panic of all sites. Uh, we had regiments that surrendered and uh, uh, it was a cold, cold, coldest winter in 40 years in Germany. We had no protective clothing. We had people freezing. Uh, I have frozen hands and feet at this point. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, by the February 3rd, we had pushed them back uh, out of uh, the bulge and back into Germany. We found the Germans to be well prepared. They had better tanks than we had, they had better equipment, they had winter clothing, and uh, we were totally unprepared because the higher-ups had felt the war would be over by Christmas of that year and hadn't stockpiled cold weather clothing. December 16th they poured out onto unsuspecting units and overran them and uh, it finally ended when we got superior forces in there about February 3rd. Uh, Bastogne was cut off. We were surrounded. That was the 101st Airborne was in there with the 10th Armored Division and uh, took a tremendous beating. But And the weather was very overcast like what we have today and the Air Force could not drop supplies or ammo or anything. But they held out and finally, Christmas Day, the skies cleared and the Air Force was able to drop supplies and ammo. They eventually broke out and uh, then the Germans began to retreat back into Germany behind the Siegfried Line. Interestingly enough, through France and Belgium and Holland, we were met by the liberated people uh, holding out wine, throwing flowers, jubilant. As we crossed into Germany, we saw white sheets hanging from windows, a very dour, uh, depressed people who were scared to look at us. They had been told that we raped and murdered and uh, stay away from us. So that's what we found, a complete difference. But rear echelon, now they were fighting for their homeland and the SS troopers committed massacres like Malmody where they uh, gunned down, uh, surrendered field artillerymen in a field, and uh, we, we got back at them for that. But uh, then as we pushed on, we began to break out onto the plains, and our tanks could start, and from there we began the big rush towards the Elba River, where we would then supposedly reach Berlin. Uh, come up across uh, prisoner of war camps and concentration camps and liberated them. Uh, the POW camps were not so bad. Uh, they were, I guess, better fed other than the Poles and Russians, which the Germans hated. But the concentration camps were gaunt ske skeletons that we saw. And without any instructions from higher ups as to what we should do, we, in our kindness, wanted to feed them our high calorie, caloric uh, rations, our chocolate bars and our sea rations and inadvertently killed a number of them who just couldn't stand that. Now they have special rations for people that are in that condition. So we uh, overran those and then proceeded on getting lots of surrenders, which all we can do is send them to the rear and we headed for the Elbe River, one of the big rivers, and we got units across. We had second armored across, and the Germans tried to knock out the pontoon bridges by floating frogmen down and doing bombing, aerial bombing, and they, we first saw the two, ME 262 jet planes that came in, and uh, uh, I got across to see the Russians on the other side 
but at that point, it, by agreement, we were to hold at the Ruhr, uh, at the uh, Elbe River, and let the Russians take Berlin. Eisenhower had been advised he would get, have 100,000 casualties, and there was a whole political thing involved in the Russians taking Berlin. Uh, VE Day came along and they celebrated. We did not. Uh, we were emotionally and physically worn out and we also knew we had to go to the Pacific. We had already, were already scheduled for it, but the Russians went a little wild on their side of the river, firing flares, weapons, um, uh, accordion music we could hear, dancing. Their war was basically over. I joined the military seven days uh, before Hiroshima was bombed. I was at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and there, while I was there, I saw thousands of German prisoners of war, and they were elated that the war would soon be over and that they would go back to their lives. I ended up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and took what amounted to a 17-week training program. I went in as a 135-pound kid and came out 17 weeks later weighing 170 pounds. And I was really a powerhouse physically because it was very tough. Ironically, I was trained to be a heavy machine gunner and part of a four-man crew of 81 millimeter mortars. Heavy weapons, they called it. Also, I learned everything that they could teach me about fighting in the jungles, identifying Japanese airplanes, even learning 50 or so idioms in Japan because when I went into training, we were still at war with Japan and the troops now Many of the troops, hundreds of thousands, were being assembled for the invasion of Japan. Ironically, I ended up in Europe in December of 1945. When I arrived in Germany in 1945, the end of the year, 1945, I saw a total devastation. Cities had just been razed completely. There were tens of millions of displaced people. These people were not only displaced, they had no idea where to go, where their homes were, where their families were. The concentration camps, the horrendous concentration camps had been emptied and there were actually hundreds, maybe over a thousand, displaced persons camps that were trying to get people back into a more normal life. And uh, I saw these people uh, and wondered how I got there and what could I do to make their life better. And, only as an 18-year-old kid at the time, I realized that this time and place in my life was significant. I ended up joining the 5th Infantry Regiment in a little village called Ebelsberg, Austria. That's right outside of Linz. And the second day I was there, I was in formation, and I saw this corporal staggering it looked as if he were drunk. And the first sergeant walked over to him, put his arm around him, and gently moved him away from the formation, and he went into the building. And when I saw his face, I was astounded. His face was a death mask. His eyes were piercing. His hands were trembling, and he was walking with the help of the sergeant 
back to the building. I was astounded. I didn't know what it was. And later on that afternoon, I went to the sergeant and I said, that corporal, what is wrong? What's wrong with him? And he said, oh, Corporal Shields. He was in the advance group of the 42nd Rainbow Division that liberated that cow. And when he saw the survivors and he smelled the horrible, horrible death camp of the gas ovens, he jumped on a tank that had a 50 caliber machine gun mounted. He saw six German prisoners of war and he killed them all. He killed the six men, screaming, yelling, enraged, almost insane. I will never forget Corporal Shields' face. It was a mask of death. Walnut Creek salutes all who have served our great nation. You will not be forgotten.